Turner, I think we're good to go. Good evening. Uh, my name is Turner Bitten. I am the executive director of Westview Media. We are proudly the West Sides community newspaper. Uh, we serve the vibrant six neighborhoods on the west side of Salt Lake City. And tonight we're excited for the first in a series of town halls that we are hosting on the 2020 census. The 2020 census is one of the most important things that we can do individually to support our community. Um, and we're joined tonight by Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall, who will be kicking off a challenge that Salt Lake City is participating in with some of our neighboring cities and counties. Uh, so I will first let her introduce the challenge and then we will get into the town hall tonight. We're joined by leaders from the West side who will will introduce in a second, who are helping us increase census participation. But before that, let's begin with Mayor Mendenhall. Thank you, Turner, and thank you to everyone who is helping to move this forward, spread the word, and help us all be counted during this time. So welcome tonight to the My Voice, My Census, My Future Community Town Hall. The 2020 census is well underway. This once in a decade undertaking is more than just an exercise of counting everyone who lives in the United States. It's about representation and it's about resources for our community. And now more than ever before, really, it's imperative that we have a census that reflects Salt Lake City. The 2020 census will inform funding for the things that our community needs to grow and to thrive. It ensures that your family and your community and your city get fair representation in all branches of government and access to resources for education, affordable housing, health care, transportation, and more. Counting kids. A population that is undercounted in the census ensures that we have a seat in the classroom, access to free and reduced school lunch, and later down the road, Pell Grants for college. But with everything that's at stake in the census, only 63% of Salt Lake City residents have responded so far. I know that some residents may not feel safe responding to the census. It's understandable that in this political climate, there might be a hesitation to give your information to the government. But I want to assure you of the safety and the confidentiality of the census process. Your census information is not shared with law enforcement, landlords, or immigration agencies. And there is no citizenship question. Your privacy will be protected. So to encourage Salt Lake City to take the census and to be fairly I'm excited to announce that we have joined the final countdown, a census response rate challenge, and Salt Lake City is complete competing against West Valley City, Provo, and Orem City to see which of our cities can raise its census participation the most. From June 1st through the 30th, community members can participate by completing their census, and you can track our city's progress and compare it to other cities' response rates at 2020census.gov uh, slash en slash response rates. And we will link that in the face in the comment section. So I'm calling on you, Salt Lake City, please participate. I heard today that Provo's at a 69% uh, response rate. So we cannot let this happen. Let's make sure our city gets the funding that we need and the representation that we deserve in Washington. So you can respond online now, really anytime at my2020census.gov or through the phone or by mail. Uh, I'll turn the time over now to some of our amazing local activists and community organizations to talk more about why the 2020 census matters to our community. Thank you, Turner and everyone else. Thank you, Mayor Mendenhall. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, before I turn it over to our panelists tonight, I'd just like to uh, mention a couple of housekeeping items. The first is that we are pleased to provide ASL interpretation tonight, uh, and we hope that this event is more accessible because of that. Um, on the technical side of things, there are many pages that are sharing this event live on Facebook. So as you uh, respond and, and you, uh, we encourage you to submit your own questions through the variety of Facebook pages, 
uh, that are sharing the event live. Um, with that, I'd like to first turn to Victoria and let <clears throat> Victoria introduce herself. Please share your name, your organization, and why uh, the census matters to either you or your organization. Hi, I'm Victoria Petro Eschler. I am an incredibly proud Fair Park resident, um, and I am the executive director of Salty Cricket. We build uh, community around anyone who finds themselves in any kind of margin using music. We proudly serve at Wallace Stegner Academy through our after school program. Um, and this is really important because I love people who don't realize how important their voices are. And I want to make sure that those voices are heard, not for any reason other than they should be. The people I know and love here on the West Side are some of the most resilient, creative, strong, empathetic, full of fortitude kind of people I've ever met. And if anyone deserves to have their voices heard, it's those people. Thanks, Victoria. Anna, we'll go to you next. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Anna Wen. I am part of the OCA Asian Pacific Islander American Advocates Utah chapter. Um, yeah, we are our local chapter from a national organization. And our focus is to civil engagement and community involvement to basically serve um, those in needs who are in the most vulnerable states. Um, and I think this is important because we just need to recognize those the communities that do exist because um, a lot of us are invisible and it's about time that we show um, what our numbers are and our voices. So, yeah. Thanks, Anna. Howell, we'll go to you next. So, hello, my name is Huelei Organista. I'm here representing Casa Quetzalcoatl. Uh, it's a nonprofit that focuses on the Latina, Latino, Latinx community in Utah by focusing on developing decolonized leadership. And um, yeah, we're super excited about the census. You know, um, you know, I've been an educator uh, here in the Salt Lake School District, and I think the more we can have people fill out the census, the more resources that can be at our schools, the more resources uh, resources can be for our, our community. And um, just like what uh, the mayor mentioned, we need people, even though if you're undocumented, to fill out the census because the resources are, th are there for you too. So yeah, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Uh, Margarita. Hi everyone, my name is Margarita Satini, Malo um, I am the uh, executive director for the Utah Pacific Islander Civic Engagement Coalition, AKA UPSEC. I'm also an organizer with the Sierra Club and census is important to me, important to my community because a thriving uh, community is one that's very well funded. And the only way that we're going to get well funded is if we provide accurate count. Um, and many other people in my community are heavily dependent on many of the programs, just like all of us are dependent on so many of the programs that are dependent on census data. So census is so crucial and I'm just happy to be here. Thank you, Margarita. Um, I'm going to direct my first question to Victoria, since you work in education, and then Howell, I'd like you to answer after Victoria as well, but how, can you tell me how the census impacts education and the programs that you work on? So not only do I work in education, I am an arts educator. So that's like a double whammy for trying to make sure that we get adequate resources. But we know a few things. We know that access to high caliber arts education can be the difference for some students achieving in other domains. It can lead to higher graduation rates. Uh, teachers in schools where arts are offered um, have better outcomes as teachers, lower burnout rates. And all of those things are dependent on high caliber streams of revenue flowing to those schools. Um, and often those governmental dollars are decided based on population centers. And once every 10 years, we go through and we count everyone in the country to make sure we know how to direct the funds. And that's why we need you to respond now so that in eight years, when the new crop is in school, we have enough for them as well. This is a, this is a long lasting impact that makes sure that uh, it's not just today, but in perpetuity, our kids are able to compete with the rest of the world. 
Yeah, so we're all, we're talking about the West Side, right? So the West Side has the majority of the student body in the school district here in Salt Lake City, and um, the students that once they're counted, right? Um, then they, we figure out what resources are needed for that community. Um, some of the things that are funded are um, free and reduced lunch, right? Um, which I was a part of, and that's very important for a lot of students, even though through the pandemic right now, lots of these students are still dependent on these programs and including during the summer. And so that's just one example um, of how our community needs these resources. Of course, others is building new schools. I, I'm really happy that within our school district, we've prioritized the West Side and had, have been able to create and build new physical buildings. And that's because of census data, right? Um, and then keeping those those buildings up is is important. Um, the other thing is when you count our population, um, there's also redistricting of of where the boundaries are for where where you're voting. Um, so that's the school district, but then we have our state representatives and our congressional um, people, and they make decisions on education also. Um, and so it's important for us to know that um, numbers do count. And we do have a lot of numbers here in terms of kids, and those kids need to be counted um, here in Salt Lake City in the West Side. Um, you know, right, just specifically in the Rose Park area in Precinct One, we have around um, almost 10 schools, and that's a lot. And so I just want to make sure that people take the census, and and we're super. I'm super glad we're having this discussion about how it affects the education system. Thank you. Uh, my next question I'd like to direct to. Margarita and then Anna, if you would also answer. Um, one of the things that comes out uh, of the census right now is there's this focus on uh, hard to count populations. Uh, and I'd like you to share, uh, because you're both community organizers, why some communities are considered hard to count. Do you want to go ahead, Anna, and answer that first? <laughs> Yeah, um, first thing that comes in my um, head is that definitely the language barriers. Um, you know, we, um, especially within Asian American communities, you know, we have um, parents that do are immigrants, so they are not technically are educated as we are as first generation, second generation. So there's definitely needs, um, there's needs for that. So I definitely want to give a shout out to API Vote and also um, another organization called CAARAC, um, CIRAC, who has been really been pushing that to get those in language resources for our communities out there. So, yeah. I mean, there are many reasons, right, why uh, an or uh, a community would be hard to count, right? There's like distrust of government. There's distrust of the information getting out there that they don't want to have access to. Um, there's, you know, again, like Anna said, there's language barriers. Um, a lot of people have, you will not, this is so hard to believe for me, but there are people who are like, what's the census? Who have never taken the census, right? So I think the Census Bureau did a really good job as far as creating like a partnership specialist uh, approach to filling up to, you know, um, engaging and, and informing and educating people about the census because they sent people out there to create relationships with you know hard to count communities to build trust and to talk to them and inform them about the importance of taking census but really there's like you know there could be a lack of access to a computer lack of access to internet you know distrust of the government i mean there's so many reasons you know and many of these many of the hard to count communities are people who have several jobs who are never home you know and and a lot of people don't understand what is the census. So, um, th you know, there's several reasons why, um, you know, many of these communities are hard to count and why it's it's crucial for organizers and just different organizations to do a lot of on the ground uh, grassroots outreach to educate and inform. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna take just a, a quick pause. Um, Bronwyn, the the camera is obstructing your interpretation. If you can move your camera down just slightly. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Uh, so there were a couple of themes that were touched on repeatedly, and, and one is distrust of government. Um, 
Last year, there was a, a highly publicized effort to get a citizenship question on the census. Um, and fortunately, that effort failed. There is no uh, census question or no citizenship question on the census this year, which is something that I know that this group will celebrate. Um, on that note, what I'd like to ask uh, each of the panelists is, what advice would you give to someone, or if someone asked you a question about why they can trust the census, what would you tell them? And uh, we'll start with Victoria. It's a really hard and complicated question, as, as direct as it sounds. Um, within even micro communities, there's different reasons for distrust. And so, um, the best thing I can say is if you're someone who understands the importance of the census and you have a relationship with someone who's unlikely to, please do your part. I don't put the onus on people who distrust to trust. I put the onus on those of us who understand to share information that is valid and viable with those who need it. Um, pero si está escuchando y eres de la comunidad uh, de mí, por favor, óyeme que es algo seguro para usted, no es peligroso, y también es importante. Nuestros hijos necesitan el dinero y nuestra comunidad necesita los recursos de este census. Por favor, si hay preguntas, mándame un email, mándame un text. Yo puedo ayudar. Thank you, Victoria. And um, I just want to mention really quick, I said at the beginning that this was the first in a series of town halls. We are actively planning another town hall in the middle of June that will be entirely in Spanish um, to be accessible for our Spanish speaking neighbors. So I wanted to flag that. We don't have a date right now, but we will be sure to share that information. Uh, with that, Anna, I'd like to move to you with the, the same question that I asked Victoria. What advice would you give to someone who maybe doesn't trust the census? Um, definitely just try to educate yourself. There's definitely a lot of resources out there that can kind of go in depth more about what does the census is for and how it's going to be used and um, what can it give back to our communities. Um, I think there's, you know, there's definitely just a lot of resources out there now. And, and yeah, def definitely if you're in that privilege um, aspect, to take advantage of it because it's only every 10 years. So, you know, take take the moment, yeah. Right, uh, Margarita. Um, so I, I, was a, I was a partnership specialist with the Census Bureau for like over a year. Um, and one of the things that we have to do as, you know, somebody who works for, who works with the Census Bureau, you have to take a light, you have to make a lifetime oath never not to you know um not to uh, abuse your privilege as a data steward under the census bureau and if you do you're facing you're looking at facing upwards of five years in federal prison and a two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine first of all i don't have the money or the time and i don't feel like going to prison for anybody um not only that but they, uh, the census bureau also has a very robust information technology department where a bank might have like seven lines of encryption for safety for safeguarding your data, the Census Bureau has about 14. They have 14 lines of encryption. Um, and then, you know, number three, we're fighting, you know, the data, collecting data is nonpartisan. What people do and what organizations do with data is partisan. So I think we're not only battling um, distrust, we're, we're battling misinformation that's out there, you know? And so that's our number one battle. So I agree with all the other panelists as far as the importance of making sure that you're educating, staying on message, that you're building those trusting relationships with yourself and the people that you're working with on the ground. Like, and it has to happen nonstop, continuously. It has to just continue. I mean, this is these are, these are the relationships you're building and it requires that you're constantly communicating, that you're showing up and that you're present. So, um, I think for us, in, in order for us to fight the distrust, um, it's just to continue to be, you know, to show up and to provide, you know, information and to educate correctly. Correctly. Thank you. We'll move over to Joel. Um, I don't know if I'll try to convince anyone to try to trust the government. <laughs> uh, 
um, in terms of like helping them and maybe try to convince them to take the census, um, would be just kind of saying some facts, right? Um, you know, I'll empathize first, right? And understanding why they might be um, confused or why they might um, think certain things. But um, some of the facts on there are, you know, there's literally thousands of dollars uh, per person that are not going to be accounted within those, you know, 10 years. Um, and and that's gonna, it's going to really affect our communities. And, and that has been affecting our communities. So, um, you know, because in the past each 10, 10 years in the past, like our community hasn't been taking the census, right? Um, and so just imagine if our community did, how many resources we be, would be having. Um, but yeah, so um, sometimes I, you just gotta, you know, <laughs> You don't gotta convince them on certain everything, right? Um, but at least you gotta uh, talk to them, and and the biggest thing is just answer questions because that's what usually people have is questions, and so just answer their questions. And I like what Victoria mentioned, which was like, um, you know, those that already understand it should be the ones that are trying to help others share information, and and the ones that don't know yet, um, you know, that that's just you just work you work with them. You're empathetic, and the the worst thing you can ever do, right? So if we can say the bad practice would be like shaming people, right? Don't ever shame anyone for not taking the census. That's literally the worst thing you can do. Not only for that, but it could be voting, shaming people because they don't vote, shaming people because they don't do certain things. Um, that, that's not what we should do. It should be having empathy and helping inform people um, as much as possible. Thank you. Um, as we've talked about a couple of times here, I just want to crystallize some important things. And the first is that there is not a citizenship question on the census this year. And the second is that your data is protected by, by the force of federal law, as Margarita stated. The other thing that I would like to stress is that the you can take the census in whatever language you are most comfortable in. And you can do it online at 2020census.gov. Uh, it will take you less than two minutes. Um, or you can do it by phone if you're more comfortable. The, the thing that I want to emphasize uh, for communities that are, are maybe distrustful of government is that by answering early and responding, you maintain the power in the equation. What we don't want is for folks to be uncomfortable when uh, census takers are sent door to door. Um, so by answering early and doing it online and doing it over the phone, you have the power and it gives you the ability to prevent having folks coming to your door, which I, I am empathetic is uh, a pretty jarring experience given our current political climate. Um, we've talked a lot about resources and funding, and I'd love to shift the conversation a little bit um, because the census also determines our elected representation and our political representation for the next decade. So this is a broad question, but it ties back into this idea of representation. And I'd like to give each of you an opportunity, uh, starting with Howell, to talk about what representation means to communities on the West Side and why building political power and, and, and embracing that representation is so important. Totally, and, and just to, you know, can just echo what you said about uh... Um, if you're proactive and do the census before, uh, people won't go and show up in your house, right? Um, and <laughs> um, the census workers can come up to your house up to like, I think, eight or six times. And so you better just do it ahead of time so they don't show up. But um, so anyways, but representation on the West Side. So, well, um, we, you know, Rose Park, um, West Side Coalition boundaries includes Glendale too. Um, I'm in West Point, um, and so we have, just think about it, we have two state representatives for our boundaries. That's a big deal, um, because of just within the city, we have two representatives in the state um, level. We have one senator, and it's kind of, it's kind of the boundaries are weird. Um, and then, of course, we have um, state senators, and then, of course, we have two uh, congressional senators. So we have lots of representation. Um, but, um, when we actually take the census, 
and we know the numbers are there, right? Uh, the population is is continuing to grow, and even just with the Latino, Latina, Latinx community in Utah, we are doubling every ten years. So in two thousand ten, um, and then going now two thousand twenty, we we have already doubled in Utah, and it's going to double again next uh, ten years, and so. Um, you know, a large majority of our population is in the West Side and, you know, we see them in our community. And so um, it's super important for us to to take the census because in the end that might change. We might have another representative, state representative, or it might change to a, a, a maybe a, a new school board seat or um, a new city council seat. Who knows? I don't know. Right. Um, and so it's important for us to to know that the more we're counted, the more uh, we can have uh, the chance to have representation in all levels of government, from the local level, the state level, and the federal level. Uh, thank you. I'll move that question over to Margarita next. I mean, representation for me means I, I don't even I couldn't even top what um, our brother Organista has just said right here because he he explained it perfectly. You know when we get an accurate count of the numbers of people that we have in our community, then you're looking at diversifying like political, you know, policies. Um, you're looking at uh, possibly gaining an additional, rep, you know, seat, Senate seat, uh, House of Rep seat, and those seats could look very different. It could look like many of the people that are on this, on this call, you know, so, um, and then also, you know, building political power means um, making sure that our, our communities are well funded. To me, funding is I mean, I absolutely love that we're going to find out. I can't wait to find out what the, the final count is. And I hope it's as accurate as possible. But I'm also really excited about just making sure that we get the funding that these communities deserve, that they need to be able to build a thriving economy. And this is how, I mean, there's so many ways to build political power. That for me is probably the most important, just making sure that we have funding and that our communities have complete access to those funds, you know? So um, yeah, that would be my reason. Thanks. Uh, we'll move over to Victoria. So full disclosure, when I moved here nearly a decade ago, um, I'm originally a New Yorker and I married a Utah native. And so we came back here and I had all of those typical preconceived notions about Utah. Um, was I going to be the darkest one in every room that we went to? Um, was everyone a Mormon? All of those preconceived notions. Um, I moved here and fell in love with the west side instantaneously as a matter of fact we live in the house my my husband's grandmother lived in her whole life and the west side was the only place i wanted to live my my family in law tried to counsel me out of it this is the only place to live in utah i am convinced and so now that i'm putting down roots here i realize i have the most spectacular representation i've ever had in my life with Luz Escamilla as my state senator, Sandra Hollins as my representative. They are responsive and dynamic and they're fantastic. And I watch them. They play defense better than any women I have ever seen. When the rest of the state looks at us and says, let's defile ecosystems and put prisons there because we want that land down in Draper for development, they play defense for us. When they say, let's let those fairgrounds rot because who really cares about the West Side? They get proactive. When people say, let's put an inland port over there, they do what they can. Now, I would love to see a world where they don't have to just play defense. I'd love to see a world where they could do what I know they can do, what Angela Romero can do, where they have more power, where they have more sway. I'd love to see a world where our federal delegation has to respond to us because the other places that we're deluded by can't be overwhelming to us. And we have the population density for it. We just have to prove it. So for us, important things, literally from the air we breathe to who our neighbors are, to what our schools look like and who they're made of, all of those things are impacted by the responses we get right now. And we have nothing short of stellar levels of representation and and qualifications here on the west side we just need to prove that we have to be listened to i mean the 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 downfall of democratic systems is that might does make right we have to prove the might of our population we just have to stand up and be counted because we have every other natural resource here on the west side already 
Victoria, I think you live across the street from my brother. I do. I love him, and I'm asking one of your nephews to feed my cat while I'm out of town. <laughs> <laughs> and your mother was a saint, and losing her has broken my heart. So thank you. Sorry, we totally went like. <laughs> It's okay. Your conversation was drowned out by all the snaps that came in after Victoria. We went, we went west side. <laughs> uh, Anna, I'd like to move on to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. So much what everyone has brought up already. Um, I think it's just it definitely it's just important to be represented because it provides you know inclusion and it builds that trust that it's been lacking for you know throughout these years. So again, we're just trying to connect again and really truly um I showcase the real stories and our of our individuals so yeah thank you um and before i move on to the next question i'd just like to remind the audience that we would love to have your questions come in um i'm, I'm about to get into audience questions so if you have one please leave one in the chat of the page that you're watching on we'll make sure that we get it asked um with that, Hoel mentioned something uh, as he was responding to the last question that the population uh, of our country is changing and the demographics of our country are changing. And who we are as a community is reflected in the census. Um, so what I'd like to ask the panelists is, it's a, it's a build on of the last question, but the, the current crisis that we're living through has demonstrated some of the vulnerabilities that our community has. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize that the West Side has been so hard hit by the COVID-19 crisis and that our communities are mourning neighbors who've passed away. And we have to acknowledge the legacy of racism and other, uh, other forms of oppression that have tamped down representation and power on the west side. So with that, I'd like to ask a bit of a COVID question because the census dictates the number of schools and, and, uh, and, and public safety resources and other community resources. What I'd like to ask the, the, the panelists is, let's pretend we got to 100% representation what would be your number one wish list for the West Side? What resources and what does the future of the West Side look like to you when we stand up and are fully counted? And I'm going to start with Victoria because you're smiling so much. I like to say I'm an abundance thinker, so I'm a both and, not either or. <laughs> So there's so many things. Um, we have serious food desert issues down in the Poplar Grove in the Glendale area, and I don't see how we can ignore that in the new lease that's overpriced on Third West does not count. Um, I'd like to see efforts to temper gentrification. There are people who made this community what it is, who are being chased out by property values. My own house just appraised for something I could never buy it for. Um, and, and I'd like to see something that creates an equitable future for the people who made this community amazing and doesn't chase them away to other places. Margarita, we'll go to you next. I honestly, and I, I, I love that idea, Victoria, and I agree with you. I would love to see uh, the West Side be more, be like food independent, energy independent. I want them to have a, a thriving economic base you know, something that, you know, provides like economic stimulus for families that are in these communities. And I definitely the gentrification part of it. I already have friends who have already been pushed out of the community who have lived there forever, whose families are from the West side. And it is heartbreaking, you know, that our, that we're still not able to address our housing crisis uh, correctly, you know. Um, but that's exactly how, that's what I envision um, for our community on the West side is to be completely, you know, energy, food, uh, have a thriving economic base, and just for them, for our community to just live, not just survive, live, live a full life. Thanks. Anna, what about you? Um, definitely embracing more cultures. Um, I think that's why we kind of, unfortunately, have seen um, discrimination, especially through this pandemic that has um, 
has affected our Asian American communities. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just um, more community based support, because a lot of community work does help us to build a better relationship and, you know, further on to like making policies and, you know, getting accessibility to education, um, all these other infrastructures. So, um, yeah, I think it's just to kind of just continue to embrace the diversity that we have within our community. Well, we'll go to you last. So um, last summer, um, we Salt Lake City held the um, 80 something, I think it was Civil Society uh, United Nations Conference. And um, from there, um, a couple of months later, which I was involved with that, I went to the United Nations as one of the youth leaders in the environmental justice movement. And I don't know why the world doesn't realize, you know, we in 10 years, we'll have the census again, but maybe in 10 years, the world environmentally or just physically might not be very livable if we don't drastically change things. And so um, if my wish list would be very clear on how um, we really, you know, the, the, the scientists have made it clear that the, the, the world, if we don't drastically change things within the next nine years, not even 10 years, right? Um, lots of people are gonna be, you know, not doing well. Um, and so, um, and um, so the west side of Salt Lake City and how we can be leaders, um, since we had the United Nations here, how can Salt Lake City be a leader and in including the west side uh, when it comes to uh, green jobs, um, you know, I think Margarita and Victoria may mention sustainability in many, many ways, right? From community gardens to lots of local ways of like how we should be living that's sustainable in every kind of way in our life. Um, it's because if we don't really do that, um, you know, that that's our only chance within the next couple of years. And so that's the reality. And so my wish list is you know, we do get a hundred and then from there we do get the resources. And then if we, even if the resources aren't always coming from the government, at least from the federal government, it's coming from the local government. I think we have good city level um, leadership and then our state is reasonable in terms of, you know, some environmental things. And so I think the West side could be a very a big leader and whether we have development or no development on the West side, including the inland ports and, and what is happening. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of what my wish list would be, which would be very focused on, you know, the next kind of local Salt Lake City Green New Deal situation um, or the seven generations um, kind of concept that that came out recently with some of the indigenous communities about how we are should be living sustainably. Thank you. Um, I do want to respond to a question that we just received on Facebook. Um, uh, Robert from Facebook asked us why we didn't invite anyone from our African American community here tonight. Um, and, and what I want to share is the reason that we selected the panelists we did is that our Hispanic and our AAPI communities are particularly undercounted in the census. And we wanted to specifically focus on those communities tonight. Uh, we are committed to representation. And as I said, um, this is the beginning of a series of these town halls, and we absolutely are committed to ensuring representation of our entire community. Uh, I want to acknowledge that, uh, and thank you for your question, Robert. Um, the, the next question that I'd like to move on to um, is the topic of development on the west side. Funding that comes through the census uh, is used to promote economic development, it's used for uh, housing development, as Victoria mentioned. So the next question that I'd like to ask um, is, as you think of, of development on the West Side, what role do each of your organizations play, both in ensuring that complete count, and then what is the benefit of the folks you serve having been counted fully, uh, if, if that makes sense? Uh, we'll start with Hoel. Okay. <laughs> so to review, um, Casa Quetzalcoatl is a 
local organization that focuses on the Latinx, right, Latino, Latino community in, in here. Um, we mostly focus on young adults. So that's people ages 18 to, let's say, 35. There's not really a cap on young adults, right? What's, what's a young adult anymore, right? <laughs> and so um, we're all young adults here on this on this call. So <laughs> and um, so that's our target audience, right? Um, within that group, a lot of those people aren't counted, right? First of all, Latinx people. Second of all, college students or young age, young adults. Um, it's kind of mixed. Some of them are here and at home still. Some of them are in college. Some of them, it's just really hard to know how you're going to be counted. And those are legit questions for people. Um, once they're counted, you know, college funds are important because from there, um, money does go to, you know, state, you know, you know, you know, money go goes to our education, not only K to 12, but I read, um, including grants, federal grants, right? Like FAFSA. Um, and so um, uh, within that, um, those young adults within the next 10 years, um, so I graduated 10 years ago from high school. 10 years later, I'm here, right? I'm, I'm not in high school anymore. You know, I've actually taught in high school. And so the same thing is going to happen now. The people that are graduating right now in 2020, and they're going to have their car parades, right? Um, those people in 10 years later are going to be thinking back and they're going to be having their own kids that weren't counted this time. But hopefully they realize that once they come to themselves, those resources are going to go to their kids. Because if someone has a kid right now, when I was at Horizonte, some of my students had kids. 10 years later, their kids are going to be 10 years old. Um, I'm not sure what grade that is, but that's elementary school for sure. And so you got to think about that. Um, and so um, it's very important for us to think about young adults and how um, just 10 years later, they're still going to be young adults, but they're going to be in their 30s. And then those people in their 30s are going to be in the 40s. Uh, thanks. We'll move on to Anna. And sorry, could you just um, kind of go through that question again? I just want to make sure that I kind of try to answer all of it that you're bringing up. Sorry. I definitely created some word salad as I stumbled into that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll, I'll rephrase it, but what does a complete count mean to you and your community? Yeah, so it's basically because um, basically I'm I grew up and still live right in Taylorsville, and so I'm thinking of like. Um, all the things that are surrounding me. So we're thinking about the roads, like construction work, you know, how to um, build more safety areas. Um, how can we build more community, um, like, sorry, community um, gardens and like sustainable kind of things like that. And I'm also thinking about education, you know, how do, how do we um, provide students who are coming from low income families or um, are in, you know, financial needs. So I think it just kind of comes back to, again, like funding our resources and getting accessibility to um, these things that do affect our um, livelihood in a way. So. Thank you, uh, Margarita. Every time you say my name, I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, so for my community, I mean, uh, Ubisec, uh, we, as far as census is concerned, like, I know that our entire community is hard to count, but we also have community members who are low income that, and those are the ones that I'm really focused on because many of them are dependent on, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, WIC. I mean, you know, and then we have a lot of kids who are really dependent on the school, national school lunch program, right? And these programs are ones that, are dependent on uh, uh, census data. So if I have 20 kids in my class and I'm only and I've only counted for five, I'm only going to get budgeted for five kids for 10 years. That's my only opportunity. And I love using that example because everyone's like, wait a minute, what if my kids like not the five? You know, and I'm like, these are the things that we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid the shutdown of WIC offices. There was one office uh, WIC, or it was yeah, it was a WIC office in Salt Lake County. It was closed because they said they didn't have the the numbers. They didn't have the numbers to justify staying open. I already know in my heart that's a lie, you know. So uh, we have many people who are dependent on these programs. To me, I want to make sure that those programs still exist. I want to make sure that they're fully funded. Um, and I think I understood your question, but uh, that's why it's important to me, you know. Um, and that's why we're focused on 
I'm, I'm constantly pushing funding because my community really understands dollars. You know, they work, they're survivors, they work hard, they do that, they want to make sure that they have a roof over their head, you know, food on the table. And then I have to tie the relationship between census and all the decisions that they make in their lives and how the census plays an important role in their day to day lives, them and their families. And so, um, you know, if, if we tell them, sometimes I'll just keep the messaging simple and say, hey, the government has a lot of money and we have to help them figure out how to spend it and where to spend it. And they're like, oh, okay, we get that, <laughs> you know, fill it out, you know? So um, I, I hope I answered your question, Turner. You did, thank you. It was a solid answer, so. <laughs> <laughs> it pairs well with mine. Uh, Victoria, we'll, we'll go to you last. Um, so the constituency that I work with most um, are new Americans, people who recently immigrated and their families. Um, and so for these, some, most of these families, just understanding that they are important um, enough to be counted is something that's really an abstract concept. Um, either the places where they come from don't have those infrastructures or they were a marginalized group and therefore made to not feel important. So in my estimation, I 1000% second that um, for my community, the education dollars potentially are the single most important thing to come out of this. Um, I work with the most capable, gifted p young people I've ever met in my life. The only difference between them and anyone else is just opportunity. Um, I literally provide them nothing but a venue through my programming. Um, but the other thing is just uh, the chance to be heard. I always say that Utah is the best intended place I've ever lived. I have never lived in a place where so many people had so many amazing intentions. The execution here though can get really wonky and margins can feel really, really margin. And this is one of those places where the East-West divide is, is really vibrant, especially in the minds of those of us who live in the margins, either by virtue of our geography, where we live, our race, our languages, our orientations, whatever it is, this is one of those ways that that east-west divide in Salt Lake City is really, really felt. And so I really think the best thing that would happen is that there would be weight given to the voices of the people who live here. They don't need saving. They don't need anyone to come in and give them anything that they don't have. What they need is the opportunity to be heard, counted, and given the full weight that other constituencies throughout the city are being given. And in addition to the policy things that my very capable co-panelists have already pointed to, that is the biggest thing for me. I want to see the people I work with who every day prove to me that, you know, I've, I've got two master's degrees and a supportive family. They, they face challenges that I would have fainted in the face of. And so they don't need me. They don't need the panelists here to do anything except to just help them get the chance to be heard. And that's really what I want to see come out of the census, extra weight for the amazing resourcing we already have over here. Here, here. Um... Uh, so a question that's come in on the back end that I'm going to just take a second to respond to. Uh, after we mentioned folks coming to the home of, of uh, folks that haven't taken the census, there was a question about what precautions are be being taken in the face of COVID-19. I mentioned that the West Side has been disproportionately impacted. Um, and we just want to let you know that the Census Bureau is following the latest local, state, and federal health guidelines. And, and folks from the Census Bureau are wearing protective equipment. Um, and the initial outreach that will be done in person is being done under the, uh, the name of Operation Leave, which means that Census uh, employees will be bringing information that they can just leave at the doorstep of households that have not completed the Census. So they should not add to concerns about COVID. Um, every precaution is being taken to keep the census um, from contributing to the COVID-19 crisis. And the deadline for census participation was actually pushed back in light of what has been going on with the pandemic to October 31st. Uh, so for those of us that are practicing allyship and, and trying to encourage and help our neighbors complete the census, we have an opportunity over the summer and throughout the fall 
to continue to practice that allyship and to encourage those around us to complete the census. Um, the last thing that I want to mention before I go to closing uh, statements from, from each of our panelists is that the census is hiring right now. Um, and it's particularly important given the economic situation that working temporarily for the census doesn't count against several benefits um, that have been uh, increased to respond to the economic crisis. So by participating or by uh, working temporarily for the census, uh, the last thing we would want is for folks to put themselves in, in economic uh, uh, distress and temporarily working for the census doesn't count toward many of the temporary benefits that exist uh, given the, the economic downturn. So with that, um, I, in, in closing, I'd like to give each of the panelists one final question, uh, and this is the most serious question of all, which is, have you participated in the census and completed yours? And B, uh, just closing thoughts as, as we, we close the town hall tonight. So we'll start with Anna as we close out. Um, yes, I definitely have taken part on the census. And I just want to thank everyone who are participating on this panel and giving me um, an opportunity to kind of speak my part and represent my organization. And I have, yeah, definitely just do your best and, you know, keep um, educating yourself, gain more. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, Margarita. I laughed at that because I'm here. Here I am on the ground, like encouraging people to go and take the census. And then in my mind, I'm like, crap, I have to take the census <laughs> because I was looking at the form and I have a lot of people that live in my house. So I'm like, uh, but you know, when I went in, I was so surprised. Like the Census Bureau did a really phenomenal job of making the app, the, the site, like very user friendly, very easy to navigate. It took me less than 10 minutes to fill out. I'm not going to say how many people are in my house. It was a lot, but you know, I was able to fill everyone out with no issues. I counted all my grandkids, all my kids, all the adults. Um, anyhow, uh, and then I think the other, oh, I wanted to mention, I think you mentioned this already, Turner, but that the census is hiring for census takers. I want to thank partnership specialist from the Census Bureau, Ali Amran, uh, for letting me know that he texted me and says, remind everyone we're still hiring for census takers. Um, and then what was the last question B? It was, um, I can't remember what your question, the last question was. Uh, just closing thoughts as, as we close out. Look, in order for our communities to build political power, to be counted, to be seen, to be, you know, to receive, you know, all the resources that we should have access to, we have to not, we, we have to not be invisible or, they go, or they're going to treat us like we're invisible. The only way that we can do that is by taking the census and being counted. It's the easiest way to give back to the community. It's an easy way to like, I think when they did the, you know, when they did the numbers, they broke it down. It was like close to $2,000 per person for 10 years. What an easy way to give back to your community, you know, by filling out the census and helping, you know, your community grow. Um, but that's, that's my, that's my piece. Uh, well. uh So, um, census day is on my birthday, so April 1st, it's on April Fool's Day. So on my birthday, since I was quarantined and I couldn't have do anything, <laughs> I was like on my social media, I was like, hey, y'all, like for my birthday, um, I just want you to do two things. First, like do the census if you haven't. So I had, I'm, I, I like followed like some celebrities on Instagram and I was like, this is a wild shot. Like, what if I message them and be like, for my birthday, like do a shout out, not for me, but like to ask people to do the census. And a lot of them did it. And I was like, wow. And some of them even gave me a shout out for my birthday, which I was like, cool, but the census was important. Um, and then the second part was like, uh, I'm like running for office. And so I was like, oh, if you want to donate, donate to my campaign. But most people did the census part than, than the second part, but that's okay. I just want, that was the most important thing. Um, and of course, um, my birthday is on April Fool, so I never expect people to give me presents because they're always fake presents, um, and and I've just gotten used to that. So, so I'm happy that people took the census. That was already a month ago, or two months, two months ago. Wow, we're we're going into June. That was two months ago. 
Um, and as uh, Turner said, we still have a lot of time still uh, until October to do it. So let's continue to move forward. Um, I might have a, just a, like an Alice in Wonderland, a fake um, happy on birthday and remind everybody to do it again. And I don't know when that'll happen, but I'll, I'll do that. So yeah, I've done it. Um, and yeah, I want to make sure people continue to do it, if, uh, to do it if they haven't already yet. Thank you, Victoria. We did it by uh, computer, super easy. I didn't have to like go find other documentation. I knew all the information in my head. I was just disappointed because we um, adopted a lifelong West Side resident. She's uh, now in college up at Weber and she changed her address. So I had to let her get counted up in Ogden. I tried to convince her to stay West Side, but, <laughs> but so we, we followed the law that we only counted the people who are actually living here, but it's super easy. It's super simple. Um, there are really amazing people on the West Side working for it. My dear friend, Aaron Clevin is brilliant, commenting all over the thread on Facebook Live. So contact her if you have questions. Uh, it's super, super important, super easy. Get it done and let's show the world how amazing the West Side is. And don't let Provo win anything. I, I, here, here. Uh, I, I'd like to thank everybody who took time to watch tonight. Um, before we close out tonight, please go to 2020census.gov and complete your census. If you haven't, there's also opportunities to call in and complete the census over the phone. Uh, as Victoria said, we have a, uh, a competition to win. There's a lot riding on this, um, not least of which is our dignity. Um, we, we, we've we got to beat Provo. Uh, and as we close out tonight, I'd just like to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you for spending a Wednesday night with us. Uh, we so appreciate the work that you do in the community. Um, as has been said repeatedly tonight, the census is one of the most important things that each of us can do to support our community this year. And as we look forward to the future, the census is really the beginning of the next 10 years. So let's get out there, let's complete the census, stand up and be counted, and let's represent the West Side uh, in, in making sure that each of us completes the census. Thanks for tuning in tonight and uh, look forward for our next town hall on the census. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.